What is going on, YouTube? Uh, Andrew Miller, Shane Black from HookMadlines.com and Hook'em Horn Show. Uh, we're coming back at you all today with a uh, uh, fall camp update, uh, talking about, you know, the last two weeks or so of uh, preseason camp, um, you know, depth chart stuff, going kind of position by position as well, looking at, you know, which groups we feel like are the strongest right now, which could still bring some level of concern uh, depth-wise or maybe with the starters in the two deep. Um, with us being, what, almost exactly three weeks uh, from the start of the regular season. Uh, yeah, because tomorrow will be three weeks. Um, you know, the offseason's gone by, it seems like, in the blink of an eye. Um, that said, I feel like the first week or so of preseason camp has, has gone by very slowly just because of, you know, an unfortunate news cycle. And um, to be honest, I just feel like this year in fall camp, you know, Texas fans are just, I think they're just waiting, you know, for that. That not just the regular season opener, but you know, once week two hits this year, it's it, it's a level of intensity. It's it, it's almost a level of I would say confidence. I, I think I said this off air, but it's it's this level of confidence and comfort right now for Texas fans. I think that you know, there's not like a ton of questions being asked, or you know, there's not a whole lot of like anxiety or nerves about the team heading into the regular season you know this team's in a really good spot on both sides of the ball it, you know Starks talked about it in multiple press conferences it's been reported multiple times that you know the coaching staff the players you know, this is the deepest most talented group that texas has had in four years under sarkeesian and yeah so uh also um want to welcome in mark uh with hook'em headlines hook'em horn show as well um but yeah, let's go ahead and start right, you know, talking about fall camp here. Um, you know, we're what eight practices in now. Um, we got the first fall scrimmage coming up tomorrow. I believe uh be wrapping up Saturday afternoon. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me, and I think everyone this speaks for everyone at this point, is you know, when you had that first fall scrimmage coming up, you you do want to see that level of physicality and you you want to see a certain level of intensity. But I think the two things that everyone wants to see at this point, for one, the obvious thing is just no injuries. You know, uh, avoid that injury bug after what happened to CJ earlier this week. Um, you want this team being able to stay healthy at every other position heading into the regular season. Um, and I think the second thing is you want to hear about intensity, competitiveness on both sides of the ball that, you know, the receivers and defensive backs are matching up well one on one. But it would be concerning, I think, if we went in, in into, you know, Sunday, Monday, hearing a lot about, oh, Quinn Ewers was struggling to do this or, you know, the defensive backs just out of nowhere were really getting all over the receivers and everything. Um, I fully expect at this point Quinn to just kind of be out there slicing and dicing the defense. This is third year as a starting quarterback here. And so I, I don't think there's really any excuse for him not to just have total command and rhythm of the offense at this point. Um but I'll pass it over to y'all, Mark. I can start with you here. You know, what are some of your thoughts that in uh, camp in the first fall scrimmage? Well, uh, you, you you mentioned Quinn Ewers being on top of his game. It's time for him to take that next step. Uh, if he wants to be an elite, if you as an elite quarterback, then this is the time that he has to prove it. Why not prove it in the first year of the SEC? Uh, you know, from everything that uh, we've been told and everything that we've seen, uh, you know, going back to the SEC media day, he's the guy now. He's the guy that's going to come and lead this team to the promised land. You know, they got to the pl college football playoff uh, and, and made this next step as a program. The biggest thing is he has to stay healthy. I mean, let's, let's just be honest about that. The last, his, both of his uh, uh, two last two seasons at Texas were cut short or he missed time because of injuries. Uh, he's changed his body this year. Uh, you know, I was at SEC Media Day and he, you know, he looked bigger, he looked stronger. He talked about his preparation. And I think those are the bigger things, the maturity. Uh, and he's the out, quote, unquote, leader of this team on both sides of the ball. And, you know, Coach Sarkeesian, uh, you know, he spoke of that as well at uh, SEC Media Days. I think the biggest thing that I, I'm looking for is the emergence of Trey Weisner. Uh, I saw him do it up close and personal when he was uh, at DeSoto. Uh, that, that run that they made uh, his senior year. Well, he was one of the catalysts to that. He can play multiple positions. His ability to catch out of the backfield, I think, is something that Texas is going to be able to take advantage of it uh, with him. And then he proved his toughness by being elite on the special teams units last year. So he's got that toughness already. Uh, and uh, Jared Gibson is a guy that they've been talking about is going to get some carries on the offense. I'd like to see him mix it up tomorrow as well. Yeah, kind of, kind of taking it from there. 
you know, going back to the Quinn Ewers point, I think it's interesting. Um, uh, just the quiet confidence that he has. I mean, he's a quiet guy in general. Um, but you could tell at SEC media days, like he feels like this is a team where, where they have the chance to not only get back to a college football playoff, but you know, potentially go all the way. And, you know, we don't have to have this conversation now, but if you think about it in, in the pantheon of Texas quarterbacks, if, you know, Quinn can have a great season and, you know, potentially lead Texas deep into the playoff, he's starting to get up there in, into the Colt McCoy territory. Um, he'll be third in, in passing yards and passing touchdowns in program history. And if, if you can add, you know, a national championship on top of that, and Quinn has a chance to leave the 40 acres after everything that happened with his recruitment, going to Ohio state and then come to Texas. He has a chance to leave the 40 acres as one of the best quarterbacks of all time. So, uh, you know, that's just a, another interesting side conversation, but in, in regard to the scrimmage in fall camp going forward, I think just because of the talent in the room, I'm interested to see what happens with the wide receivers. I mean, six bona fide studs, um, guys that have done it at other universities and Isaiah Bond, Matthew Golden and Silas Bolden. And then you have the young guys and DeAndre Moore, Jonte Cook and Ryan Wingo. And all six have been highlighted in practice notes and shouted out by Steve Sarkeesian. So to me, it seems like these last two and a half weeks of camp are going to be, and especially the first month of the season on top of that, are going to be massive in how that rotation shakes out once Texas comes into SEC play. So I think, you know, we've seen these names highlighted throughout the summer and early in fall camp. But who's really going to, you know, take the next step and establish themselves as the starters in that pecking order? You know, you can't write off any of them. Um, and, and so that's something that I'm really interested to see, you know, post a scrimmage tomorrow. Who really stood out at the wide receiver position? Absolutely. You know, I, one of the things that I've been thinking is, you know, if Texas and I know I'm kind of diving headfirst in this conversation without really any lead in, but um, besides mentioning the Baxter injury earlier in the video, but like one of the things that I've been interesting interested in seeing from Sarkeesian and various practice reports, just media discussion for the last few days, is you know any potential position changes now that you know you've got what five scholarship running backs left in that room. Um, yeah, yeah. Wait, no. Four. Are we down to five, four? It's down to four, right? Yeah. 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 Down to four. yeah. Right. Um, I keep getting confused with like Nick Sanders, Colin Page, and some of those guys that were walk ons that are now taking reps with the third team. But, you know, I've been wondering if there's anyone else that Sarkeesian might try out at running back. Um, I think that an obvious move would be to use a guy like you know, one of the athletes that they've recruited, like a Darren Gallet or like a Jelani McDonald that played both sides of the ball in high school and that have a lot of like speed, versatility um, and, and experience in multiple positions. So they have kind of that understanding of the offensive flow of things to some degree, the scheme, because they played against it. You know, McDonald and Gallet have both been around for multiple years now. So, you know, to some degree have experience in that regard. One of the guys, though, that I think is an obvious choice to get more looks just motioning in and out of the backfield, kind of that sort of Keelan Robinson role is going to be Silas Bolden. You know, it's been clear at this point that Silas Bolden, he's been so good in camp, you know, first team punt return for a lot of practices and, you know, making contested catches in practice in front of the media viewing sessions. Um, he, he's been tremendous so far, I think better than advertised for sure. And um I think at this point, you know, getting him involved very creatively in the offense in different ways, motioning him around at this point is just kind of a given. You know, it gives you another way to figure out that rotation of five or six guys, get them all involved, get their touches, keep everyone happy and you know, really keep this offense flowing. So yeah, I, I, I would say off that real quick, I, I think, I mean, we saw with Bijan and Roshan and last year as well, Sark loves his 21 personnel. I yep. think if you go into the season with four scholarship running backs, naturally you're not going to run as much 21 because he's going to be wanting to protect those guys. So I think that's where a guy like Silas Bolden, you know, playing a little more in the backfield could come into play. Like I don't, you're not going to turn around and hand the ball off to, you know, 155 pounds Silas Bolden, but you know, motions, jet sweeps, things of that nature. I think definitely something, something we'll see a lot of. Yeah. And he's yeah. just, He's so fast and versatile that, like, I mean, 
you just got to think of like what type of headspace that's going to be putting opposing defensive coordinators in this year. Like, I mean, you're already, I get that some of these defensive coordinators have probably faced Sarkeesian type offenses or Sarkeesian in the SEC, whether it was with Alabama or if they were a coordinator or coach elsewhere, whatever that is. Um, But, you know, this is a new era of the Sarkeesian offense. I've talked about this before on the show earlier in the off season, really going back to late last season when you just start telling that like, Okay, things were starting to shift a little bit where, you know, I've talked about this before, playing like this positionless football in the receiving core where Texas has all these guys that, you know, Matthew Golden, Isaiah Bond, Ryan Wingo, Jonte Cook that can, you know, they're not just limited to one spot. They're not just limited to the field or the slot or anything like that. You can move them around anywhere and they can thrive, whether it's deep ball, intermediate, working between the numbers. They're just so good. You throw Bolden into this equation now where you can get him involved out of the backfield, get him out in space in the screen game. It just adds more layers to this offense and makes it harder to defend than it already is going to be with all these weapons this year. And with yours at his best point, I think, uh, you know, set to probably have a career year with it sounds like how good he's doing in camp. So um, all around this offense, I think is in a fantastic spot, even with the Baxter news. I think that, you know, honestly, sometimes. I don't mean to like just try to mask over this and everything like that and, you know, just try to use this as an opportunity to look elsewhere. I do think the Baxter was bound to have an incredible year um, and it is unfortunate, especially after he played through a lot of last season injured that, you know, I hope he gets healthy from here on out and can recover and everything like this. But I uh, because I think, you know, still has a chance to come back and be even better next year with the trajectory he was on before. That said, we have seen Sarkeesian in the past, whether it's Hudson Card and you know the Ewers injury in 2022 starting to spread things out a little bit more. Uh, last year, when you had some injuries in the running back room, you know, finding different ways to get Blue and Baxter involved and, you know, really just expanding the full arsenal that you could have with Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell and JT Sanders in the receiving core. When Sarkeesian has been forced to, you know, kind of rethink his offense and expand to all options, sometimes it brings out the best in his play calling. I don't know what y'all kind of feel about that. If you feel like just Sarkeesian himself, his game planning can be one of the biggest factors in in how Texas can succeed and, you know, really, you know, find the best case out of a worst case scenario on offense after the Baxter news. Well, I I think, you know, Shane hit on a big point about the 21 personnel. I think this is where guys like Gunner, uh, Helm, and uh, Amari Nyblock emerge, especially in the red zone. You want to be able to have that power running game set up, but be able to hit those guys in space, like you mentioned, Bolden. Uh, You know, I think that's a a fair assessment of getting him in space and allowing him uh, to get behind some of those big blockers in the screen game, jet sweeps and things like that. Uh, But, you know, if you look at this receiving core as a whole, they fit everything that Sarkeesian wants to do offensively. You know, he can go four or five wide if he wants, but he has the tight end group and the offensive line that he can trust to ground and pound those guys. Uh, I think that uh, Jaden Blue, you know, and there was a time when he was thinking about going to transfer, uh, but, you know, the injuries happen and he gets his opportunity to go in and be successful. The, he's prepared for this. Remember when he was coming out as a senior, he missed his whole senior year getting ready for this at Texas. He's seen that it happened, and he mentioned that, uh, you know, in in a couple of interviews that he saw it happen to JB, and he realized when you get your opportunity that you have to take it and cash in on it. He's already been uh, on the Dope Walker Award watch list as well. This is his opportunity to get in there and show what he can do and the reason he's uh, at Texas. I, I think, you know, with all of these guys, you see probably one of the most versatile offenses in the country, not just in an SEC. This is, yeah, I mean, the the way that Texas has been able to just build out depth at every position is is starting to pay off where, you know, we're not having, you know, I remember, I think back to like two years ago, it seems like every single year Texas has these injuries, at least one of them that are just like, you know, really impactful, knocks out a starter or two. And I think back to two years ago on that scrimmage where we lost both Junior Ankulau and Isaiah Nayor in the same same scrimmage. And, you know, not to bring back past trauma or anything like that, but, you know, it's just a symbol of how far this, or that this roster has come, you know, and this strategy of using the portal to really pluck guys at positions of need and, you know, how the player development has just come leaps and bounds, changing culture. I think that this, 
I think this situation, yeah, really highlights how good this offense will still continue to be this fall. I think this is a good transition point. Uh, one of the things I really wanted to talk about in this video was, you know, just what position groups we feel most confident in. I know we've kind of touched on some different position groups and, you know, how they'll fit into the offensive puzzle this year. But, um, you know, we can start on the offensive side of the ball here. I, I want to go through the three position groups that we each feel we're most confident in and then least confident. You don't necessarily have to rank them each way, but, you know, just where you're most confident, where you feel like there could be some concerns right now depth wise or with some of the starters on the two deep. Um, I'll go ahead and start with mine. I'll I'll say the ones that I the three ones that I'm most confident in just because I've kind of alluded to it already. Um, the obvious one here is I think the obvious two actually are quarterback and wide receiver. Um, I mean, quarterback, this this is an easy conversation for me. Um, Texas easily has the most talented quarterback room in the country right now. It's it's been tremendous to cover Arch Manning's progress, I think, year over year. You know, there's so many polarizing Arch Manning headlines that sometimes you get lost in just the day-to-day -day progress he's made, you know, just really getting to work in off-season workouts, putting on that, you know, weight in a good way. He's a guy that he's more of a dual threat quarterback, not really in that traditional Manning mold where you know, they're just it seems like completely immobile as a guy who's a Colts and a, was a Peyton Manning fan growing up. I remember just always getting concerned when you watched him get out of the pocket and start running. It's like, oh, this isn't going to go well. And then now <laughs> you you see him uh, or you see Arch and, you know, if, if you see him running outside the pocket, you're like, oh, something special might happen here. You know, those off platform throws thrown on the run, the improvisational ability, um, are big parts to his game. And I think just his ability to get the ball out on time, his improved understanding of the offensive schemes, it feels like things are starting to fall into place for him. He's going to be really good this year whenever he gets opportunities to play, whether that's garbage time. You know, hopefully not. But yours has had injury issues. Mark, you mentioned that earlier. He's missed at least one game both years as a starting quarterback for Texas. So, you know, Arch Manning, he's always just that one snap away. Got to be ready on the sideline there. And so, um, you know, beyond that, Trey Owens has been fantastic, I think. You know, he was brought in as a guy that was like like a low four-star, high three-star developmental guy. And I think he's looked the part of like a high four-star quarterback that could come into a lot of quarterback rooms and be the backup. And, um, you know, he – I think he's got a bright future – and I feel like I'm talking about Trey Owens a lot of the way because he's been healthy, though, in the way that I thought I would be talking about Malik Murphy a couple of years ago with that strong arm, you know, underrated mobility and weighs good deep ball. And just, yeah, I think that he's a he was a fantastic get in the 2024 recruiting class um, and wide receiver. We've talked a lot about it already. You know, there's 10 scholarship guys in this room, I think nine of which all are ready to be on a two, on the two deep. You only got six spots on the two deep, maybe five in the rotation that regularly are going to see live game snaps. But you're seeing that we you're seeing that we got three groups right now of receivers that can all compete. And the competition right now is, I think, bringing out the best in a lot of the wideouts. Where um, you know, I, I think whether you rotate it in. The second team right now, you know, the second team's mostly been, I believe it's Matthew Golden, Ryan Wingo, and uh, what has that been? Silas Bolden have mostly been the second team guys run this year. I think you can mix and match any way with them, with Cook, uh, Bond, and more with the first team and be just as good. Um, third for me, and I think it's a tie right now between, you know, I, I'm going to go a little bit higher level here and just say offensive tackle because I've loved the depth that's really shining at offensive tackle right now among the young guys. Like Brandon Baker has made tremendous progress, I think. They're really pushing Kojo for those second team reps. You know, one of the more underrated storylines of fall camp has been who's getting those second team offensive tackle reps, because that's really indicative of, okay, if you do, you know, last year we had an injury with Christian Jones. Cam Williams came into a really important game and didn't allow any quarterback, or didn't allow any sacks. I think just one quarterback pressure against Kansas State, I think it was. Was that? That was the Kansas State game, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. And, yep. And Cam Williams, you know, that I think that served as kind of a springboard for him and everyone to say, OK, that he can really get it done, that it's not going to take some massive leap for him to fill this starting role this year. You know, I haven't really seen anyone questioning Cam Williams starting spot in the slightest um, in fall camp. I say that to say that, you know, the second team offensive tackle 
battle, if you will, right now has really been, I, I think, pretty intense. You got Goosby kind of locking down that left tackle spot, and then you got Baker at right tackle. Kojo still fighting it out there, too. Jaden Chapman, there's just a lot of talent at offensive tackle, and you really got to give props to Kyle Flood for you know, kind of the way that he's been able to develop to you know, get a lot of these like top five, four-star high school recruits. Um, and find value with a lot of the three-star guys, too, because I think Goosby was a three-star in the 2023 class, and he's turned out to be really good so far, I think, at least in practice. Um, I, the other one, tight end. I, I think tight end is very underrated. I, I Gunner Helm, you know, Mark, I know you mentioned, you know, getting Gunner Helm and Amari Nye Black involved in the offense in different in different ways. And I, I don't want to overlook Juan Davis. Um, I covered him in a piece earlier this week. He's finally gotten to the point where it's like it feels like he's going to be like a, uh, you know, kind of a more of a versatile guy, not just, you know, not just more of a receiving tight end where he's added about 10 pounds of good weight. He's blocking better. His understanding of the offense seems to be rounded out. I think he's going to be a good third tight end for us. Um, so those are my three. Um, Mark, I'll pass it over to you on, you know, where you're feeling most confident. Well, I, I mean, we, we, we've kind of been beating it over the head with the receiver group. So that that's. That's uh, probably the number one group, followed by quarterback that I'm definitely confident in. Uh, like you said, uh, probably one of the best quarterback rooms in the country. And listen, Trey Owens may have been not on a lot of college boards around the country, but when he was at, in, in the Houston area, he played against some of the best high school talent in the country. Uh, you know, no sure was the team that put him out of the playoffs. He's been a high caliber uh, recruit, in in my opinion. I kind of covered him and saw him, uh, you know, coming up. I met him as a sophomore and saw him come up. So he's going to be prepared, probably better than any freshman that you'll see coming in. Uh, if 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 things go get out of whack, you know, where well, Ewers and you know, God forbid, uh, Arch Manning get in trouble, or uh, when I say get in trouble with injuries, this is one of the best quarterback rooms that you're going to see. And, and my third group that I would say. Uh, is the, is the offensive line. Kelvin Banks Jr. is going to be a first-round pick. You got Connor Hayden, uh, Hayden Connor, I'm sorry, uh, Jake Majors, DJ Campbell, and now you mentioned Cameron Williams, who's rounding out to be a guy that's really, really coming to his own. Uh, if you listen to what uh, Coach Sarkeesian said uh, at SEC Media Day, this is one of his deepest teams that he's had in his tenure. Deepest, talented. That's, that's the thing that he continued to say uh, and emphasize, and he's talked about it, is the talent level and the depth that they have at each position. Position, And you mentioned some of these guys, Brandon Baker on the offensive line, Cole Hudson. Uh, these guys are really, really being competitive when you come out and see the practices that they're having. And when you go into a place like the SEC, you have to have that trench warfare, that physicalness that you're going to need to play every down and every snap. you got to play four quarters. Not saying anything against the Big 12, but when you come into the SEC, this is the kind of physicalness. And, and you got to look at, you know, Kyle Flood is worth his weight in gold when it comes to recruiting offensive linemen. This is what you have to have in a program. Sometimes, you know, everybody gets enamored with the play calling uh, and, you know, uh, Steve Sarkeesian being, you know, the, the highlights of everything, uh, you know, Hollywood, if you will. The trenches and Kyle Flood have their own identity. And that's how I, I believe that Texas is going to be really confident in establishing that identity each week in the SEC up front. Yeah, I'll jump in here. I mean, we kind of covered every everything I was going to touch on. Uh, in no particular order for me, it's the same as Mark, wide receiver, quarterback, and offensive line. I think just the two things I'll bring up. Um, in regard to the offensive line, I mean, Mark just hit on it with, with Kyle Flood, and, and we know Sark wanted the big bodies entering the SEC, and that was his plan from day one when he arrived on the 40. I think, Andrew, you'd know 17 scholarship offensive linemen, 17 or 18? Yeah, I, I think it's 16 at this 16? point. Yeah. And, and, you know, I heard, um, you know, Rod Babers um, love listening to him. Or, or, he's all over the place. But he was saying uh, that, it's three deep there. Um, there. There's 15 guys. Like they feel, they're it, the third team offensive line right now could have given you know like a 2015 Texas a run for their money in the starting group, which is just insane to think about. Uh, like Mark was saying, that's what you need in the SEC. Um, I mean, Connor Robertson came into the the Red River game 
last year in, in, in place of Jake Majors and played really well. You guys mentioned Cole Hudson and Brandon Baker's already flying, uh, uh, flying up the the uh, the you know boards for lack of a lack of a better term. Um, and then my other my other point, you know, going to quarterback, and I'll ask you ask you guys this: How many teams do you think, even if it's just for the twenty twenty four season, would rather have their current starting quarterback than Arch Manning? Because I mean, clearly, you know, Quinn is ahead of Arch. I think Carson Beck in Georgia and maybe Dylan Gabriel in Oregon, potentially Milrow at Alabama. But I think I, I don't think there's more than seven teams that would take their current starter over uh, Arch Manning in 2024, which is, you know, credit to credit to Steve Sarkeesian for building this room, how he has. I well, I mean, are we going by the EA College Football 25 logic of he's already at 88 overall as a redshirt freshman, never started a game or. I mean, I mean, so- <laughs> I, so I, I, I don't hate that logic because I truly believe if Arch Manning played this season that he would finish in the top 10 of the Heisman voting, which then to me oh. would signify that he is a top 10 quarterback in the country. I don't know if I'd be ready to jump that far into it. Like, I think that I, I do think that he would be probably a top 25 quarterback, but I do still think, you know. He hasn't started a game yet. You're throwing him into the SEC, Michigan coming week two. I think that he would, I think that especially near the end of the season, you would start seeing him get in rhythm. But even near the end of the season, you got some really tough defenses and environments you're playing in for the first time ever, you know, as a team. And and for him, you know, it, it, as a freshman still, I think going into like an environment like a college station, first time since 2011 that you're having that rivalry game, how electric that's going to be. Um, you know, I think I take even against a team like Florida or Kentucky, you know, two teams that I think are going to be still difficult matchups at home in November, you know, sandwiched between rivalry games every other week. I, I for Arch, yeah, I guess I, I think that he would be a tremendous starting quarterback for Texas or really for any other team, like you said, because I'll be honest, I think this is kind of a weak. Like, I think this is kind of a weak draft class at the top of this quarterback class as it stands right now for the NFL draft. You know, we could see some new guys, you know, really, really catch up here. And maybe by the end of the season, you have like a Dante Moore starting at Oregon where he's just playing really well. Maybe Jackson Arnold really catches on at OU. I, I don't know, but um, I I do agree that I think Arch Manning, and I would go so far as to say that half of the FBS teams that, you know, Trey Owens, maybe not even by the end of the season that he could be you know, a starting caliber quarterback, for, especially for a lot of the G5 teams um, and some of the lower tier P, P4 teams. So I don't know if there's anything else you all had to mention on the quarterback room that you wanted to touch on. Um, so I, I know, will say uh, real quick, sorry. Um, you, we don't have to keep going at this, but only three scholarship quarterbacks is not a concern but if Quinn were to go down, then it's like, all right, we have two scholarship quarterbacks now. And, and, and yeah. I mean, the, the odds are that you work through uh, that, that you're running out a um, non-scholarship quarterback. Wait. Oh, wait. Yeah. Charles Wright transferred. I forgot about that. Yes. And, and there was a conversation. I, I think it was the 22. Uh, yeah. Was we had to talk about season after where, Hudson Card and Quinn Ewers were both hurt. Yes. And so I just yeah. think that you're playing, this isn't the NFL where like, you know, you're carrying two, you know, three max. Um, and, and it's or like OU court- where they picked up uh, Casey Thompson to be a backup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a good move getting a veteran like that in there because I think three scholarship court, it, it's tough mm-hmm. to get someone to come and play in, and sit in that room when you have guys like Quinn Ewers, Arch Manning and, uh, and Trey Owens in there, but you know, three scholarship quarterbacks is a little bit concerning granted if it all went awry i mean the season's kind of thrown away at that point regardless but just a thought yeah we we can save that conversation for a different day um if we if we get to that point but no i mean i i guess across the board i do understand that you know there there are certain position groups where you would like to have a larger number of scholarship guys just because right now you have so many of those scholarships being utilized in like the defensive backfield and the offensive line things like that, where you had like legitimate depth concerns 
at different points in the last few years, you know, defensive back with earlier this offseason, some of the questions being asked, the safety rotation portal, things like that. Um, I, I'm going to go over this really quickly because we've talked about the offense a lot already um, and, and some of the different positions here. But I, my three least confident, I think an easy one right now is running back just because we lost C.J. Baxter. You know, you, you're looking at Jaden Blue right now. I think I've got confidence in him that he's going to have a big season. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this earlier today in a piece I did where I, I, I said four Longhorns that I think will really blow up this season, really to become like household names, like early round potential NFL draft guys for 2025, maybe 26, depending on eligibility, things like that. But um, Jaden Blue, I think can be, a, I think he can easily be a thousand yard rusher, you know, a guy that averaged over six yards per carry last year, 500 yards, four touchdowns in the second half of the season, really just an explosive play threat. I just call him a bowling ball of a running back, man. It looks like he just cannonballs into contact and still manages to make it through and come up with positive gains. So he's really, you know, I'm rambling at this point. So y'all feel free to cut me off whenever. But like with Jaden Blue, man, and, you know, Shane, I know that you've been a Jaden Blue stand for a while. Uh, Mark, I know that you said you covered recruiting in the Houston area. So I'm sure both y'all large familiarity with Jaden Blue and his game, what he brings. That said, I, you know, Jane Blue, the one thing that I really have confidence in that I like that I had with Jonathan Brooks last year that I had with Rojo a few years ago, B. John Robinson was just awesome from day one. So it's like I can't really say it for that because that was just not that was just a given. But all these guys that, you know, at different points were like, OK, are they going to be a starting running back? Will they not be? But really just ended up living up to the hype and a lot more. Jane Blue, he just finds a way to get like those four or five yards that you need, whether it's bouncing run outs to the outside, coming up with an explosive play. He just really knows how to find that hole and really just hit it in the blink of an eye. Where for Baxter, I don't even know if he's really there yet. I think Baxter still is kind of in that developmental process, putting on weight, understanding the offense, really, you know, understanding how to take contact in the SEC after, you know, he came in pretty thin. You play in Florida. They don't have the same sort of weight rooms and everything that they do here in Texas at the high school football level, the same sort of resources. So I think he was a little bit behind in that regard. No fault of his. That's just where, you know, that's just where high school football is at in those respective states. But, uh, I, yeah, I mean, I think Jaden Blue, I've got a lot of confidence in. But, yeah, Trey Wisner, I think he can be good. I think my hesitation with Trey is that, you know, with the zone blocking scheme, with what Texas needs, especially in some of those like tighter areas of the field, third, fourth down situations. I don't know if Weisner's necessarily that guy, like a Savion Red, or even like a Baxter that can find the hole and really, you know, get get the job done for you. Um, Jared Gibson, Christian Clark, I, uh, you know, I think they will be good, and I think Gibson will be really good this year. But you know, they're still true freshmen. I think they still have a while to go in this offense. So running back to me is an obvious one. I'm going to say left guard because I still don't know if Hayden, I, I, I'll be honest, I don't know if Hayden Connor is going to be the starter at the end of the season there. Um, you know, Neto gave him a good push for those first team reps in spring ball. I still think that Neto is probably a little bit more of the upside guy there. If you're looking for someone that can give you that extra push, a body mover at the line of scrimmage, especially in those tighter areas of the field, help you with those third, fourth down woes and at the goal line. Um, I think left guard can be really good. We'll see what it looks like by the end of the season. Man, I have to pick a third position group. Um, <laughs> I'll go, you know, this is tough. I, I just out of proxy here, because I already said offensive tackle. I should have been more specific saying left tackle. Um, but I guess right guard, which is crazy because they have an NFL guy there in DJ Campbell. But you know, I, I think you you look at it right now, and DJ Campbell is still probably of the four returning starters, the most inconsistent just because, you know, he had some of those communication issues uh, over the last two years, some blunders here and there with blocking assignments. I do think that his upside is maybe the biggest of all your interior. Off Definitely. I think the biggest among your interior offensive linemen, just from a physicality standpoint, athleticism, getting out in the open field and really just pancaking dudes. He's He's a he's a he's a beast out there. And Cole Hudson is obviously someone who's seasoned, has some of that live game experiences. So, you know, that versatility, kind of your utility guy that you can plug and play him anywhere if needed in live game situations, as Kyle Flood ha has pointed out uh, the value he brings for the last couple of years. So I would go with right guard just out of proxy, but I'd say mainly left guard and running back. 
are my two. Well, I, 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 I agree with you on those. Uh, and that's just the running back, uh, just for an experience uh, thing is, you know, Jaden Blue shared carries uh, last year, uh, you know, and with JB going down, he had to step into that backup role. Now he's going to be the man. Now he's going to be the guy that's going to get the multitude of carries. Uh, and and you, you said, you know, he runs in a different, he runs with a great forward lean. You know, that was one of the biggest things that you saw him coming out of high school. And of course, you know, about the blazing speed. If he gets to the second level, it's 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 uh you know it's six. Uh you know and that's why he was so good in the return game as well as his ability to see the hole and hit it quickly. Uh, but I, I think that you know Trey Washington is a guy that uh, maybe he didn't get a lot of time last year, but when he he got some uh, you know mop up time, he made his carries count. Um, and it's, that's an experience thing as well. Of course, he was more of a special teams guy. Now he's going to have to step in and, and, and give it, give uh, blue a breather and go in and make plays at the same time. And you mentioned those guys at the guard and uh, tackle position. It's just a thing where they have to get in and mature. The more snaps, the better they get. And that's the kind of thing that, you know, Kyle Flood and coach Sarkeesian are looking for when they are recruiting these guys. Can they step in at a moment's notice and, focus and get ready to make the right plays. It's it's difficult when you're in a stadium, you know, say we're playing at A&M, 100,000 screaming fans, and you have to make those calls and signals and communicate and execute at the same time. And then uh, I would just say the other position would be, even though I like these guys at tight end, but can they make those big plays? Uh, you know, um, Jatavia Sanders made the big plays at tight end, and Gunnar Helm was that guy that came in and was a change of pace guy that could make those blocks, whereas – uh, you know, Sanders was a little more flashy guy, if you will, at the tight end position. Now it's up to Gunnar Helm to step up and do that, which I think he is. I think he's going to be one of the bright spots in this Texas offense that maybe not a lot of people are talking about. And of course, Knobloch's emerging as well. And you spoke about Juan Davis. He's a senior now. He's seen, been there and done that and been to camp, been to spring practice. And now he's seen and turned a corner physically and mentally into the offense. So those are some, some of the guys that I think are going to be standouts that not a lot of people are talking about. Yeah, Shane, I'll let you go ahead. I, I actually, based off what you were saying about Trey, uh, Mark, I, I actually have something interesting that I thought about, but yeah, Shane, you can go ahead with your, yeah, uh, Shane, I know you popped out there for a second. I uh, yeah, connection I issues maybe, but we were talking yeah. about the three least confident position groups on offense. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Get, uh, once again, I think y'all covered it well. And, and for me, uh, I'm not – I have confidence in every group uh, on this offense, which is crazy to say. But if Texas suffered no injuries, I would feel extremely confident. Obviously, then injuries come into play, and that's where you, you look to running back where you, you already dropped C.J. Baxter, unfortunately. And then, you know, if – if you keep suffering more attrition at that position, it could get bleak pretty quickly. Um, but no, as a whole, I think this offense is ready to to potentially touch that 40 point per game mark. I think Sark's been above 35 uh, in all the seasons in Austin. I think that could, you know, jolt up once again. I thought Mark made a good point about the tight ends. I'm a I'm a huge Gunnar Helm fan. Um, and, you know, Andrew, we've talked about this on previous shows, but you know, people, because of the role that Helm played next to JT Sanders, people don't realize that he was a receiving first split out wide type of tight end at a Cherry Creek High School in Colorado. So he has great hands. And we started to see that a little bit last season. But um, I, I think it's important to, to mention the tight end group just because I think it gets a little overshadowed what JT Sanders did last season and how important he was. Kind of that third down blanket. Um, you could use him in the screen game. He had one of the best, if not the best, receiving uh, seasons as a Texas tight end. So I'm not concerned with the tight end position. Uh, I just think we should note how great of a season JT Sanders had last year. And expecting to replace that um, is, is going to be tough. So, uh, yeah, but but uh, I think you guys covered it well. I think the guards are, are, are two other spots where um, – you know, you could could see a little bit of issue throughout the season, um, but uh, obviously, like you mentioned, Andrew DJ Campbell's an, an absolute freak, and I feel like this is the year where he he completely puts it together. And him and Cam Williams run blocking on the right side. I mean, in that that's a scary sight for even for SEC defensive lines. That's almost a ton of 
offensive linemen coming at you. Um, yeah, no. Uh, so, you know, Shane, what you were saying I, I about the tight end room and, uh, you know, where that production comes from, you know, I, I'm sure people haven't forgotten, but it it does get overlooked how good JT Sanders was, again, while playing through some of those lower body injuries last year. You know, a lot of people remember that OU moment on the goal line where it's just I, that's a tough situation. The ball was bouncing weird. Texas had some turnovers and it was just in that close back and forth game. And Red River, man, it just can get ugly sometimes. And so, you know, I think for Sanders, you're not going to replace him what he was able to do down the seams in the screen game, his ability after the catch to make to make some of those big plays. Ha- I'm not saying big as in like explosive necessarily, but big as in like you need that third down in that critical point of a fourth quarter in, in different junctures of the game that you could rely on him to be able to get past that marker. Just I think that Nye Black, he's that downfield threat. He's that guy that can, you know, Actually, I, I say maybe he can be that guy to get you 20 yards down the seam. He's another big target, that NFL-type measurable. is kind of, I guess, what you were hoping for, that Jaleel Billingsley from Alabama would be a couple of years ago out of the transfer portal. Just unfortunate circumstances there. But um, my question for Trey Wisner was, uh, do y'all think that he's still going to be kind of in that now dual role of like a special teams gunner and, you know, kind of that, one of those top running backs just out of necessity now, or, you know, do you think he's able to do that? Like kind of both roles now that he's stepping into a bigger role in the backfield. I think you may have to limit his snaps on that just because you don't want to risk injury. Uh, you know, those, those are very physical plays, even though they happen in, you know, 15 to 20 second uh, spans, you don't want to risk him having that injury. And now you only got one big guy that you can count on. And then, you know, do you want to throw freshman running backs into an SEC type environment on the road? Uh, ball security comes in play when you talk about running backs and you want guys that you can depend on. Jaden Blue's that guy with the experience. And then you have Wiseman who has college football experience. Those are two things that you have to count on. So they may have to scale that back a little bit. I know he was an important piece, but you can always stick a defensive back or an outside linebacker or somebody else with the same type of skill set. That's a great tackler. You'll have to scale some of his special teams activity back. Jane, what about you? Yeah, no, I, th- I think it's a great point from Mark. I mean, like I mentioned, I don't have any concerns with the offense really besides, you know, the potential lack of depth at running back because of injury. And it's not really lack of depth. You had five guys in the room, but now that's down to four, unfortunately. So I, I think there's no reason to risk Trey um, on special teams. I mean, that said, like you see, you, I think Jody Barron uh, covered kicks um last year at least at some point in time so it seems like sark's not afraid to throw some of his better players uh out on on special teams but i I don't think you got to weigh the way the risk and reward like like mark was saying and personally i i don't think it's worth it you know all that to to say um i expect Jaden blue to have you know up near 250 carries if he stays healthy like i think this has really turned into what was going to be a 50-50 split to, you know, Jaden Blue is going to turn into the bell cow here. And, um, I mean, Wisner might get, you know, five to seven carries a game. So, at that point, you know, I think it's just all, all weighing the risk and reward. So, um, personally, I think you got so many talented athletes on this roster, you, you can throw in, uh, another guy, you know, in, in that spot. One thing I do want to mention, uh, knowing where Sarkeesian comes from, like a coaching background and, you know, how he kind of philosophy and Jeff Banks and how they kind of philosophize on special teams. Uh, do you all want to guess how many uh, coverage snaps Devontae Smith had in 2020 during the 2020 season at <laughs> Alabama? I'll, I'll go. I'll go. I'll give you uh, 15. Okay, Shane. Uh, I mean, yeah, this is this is a trick question. Uh, uh yeah. Um, I'll go. Uh, yeah, I'll go twenty-five. I. It's about double, Shane. What you were saying. It's almost up to fifty between uh, kick and punt coverage. So if that gives you any insi- any insight into how they think about special teams, um, 
it it was similar thing with guys like like it, I mean, what we yeah Cam Latu the last couple of years he was at Alabama Henry Ruggs if you go back to 2019, um I mean these guys were taking regular special teams like coverage snaps while they're filling like important starting roles on the offensive side of the ball and you know these key skill positions, um I, speaks to the depth and the confidence. I think that, you know, Sarkeesian kind of comes from from this coaching philosophy at Alabama with Nick Saban. So um, looking at the defensive side of the ball now, because I think we're almost running up on an hour since we had started the video. Um, I'm I'm going to go pretty quickly here because I really think that I've really come around on this defense improving as a whole. Um, I my a lot of my concerns that I had had depth wise at a few different spots, I defensive line, especially, I think had been alleviated with a lot of what we've seen out of practice and um, in summer workouts, too. I think that a lot of guys that maybe had questions about along the defensive line, um, especially among some of the transfers, have been looking really good, uh, bigger and better than advertised when they came out of the portal. So. Um, I, the three spots for me, edge is a clear one among the strengths. I mean, holy crap, is it night and day between how we were talking about the edge room two years ago compared to where it's at now? Because, I mean, now you got, I think you got five edge rushers now that you have to play. Yep. Um, I mean, we're, and that's not even including guys like a, like a Colton Vashik, like a Zeno Umio Zulu. I mean, Justice Finkley's fighting for second, third team practice reps. Um, we were talking about Justice Finkley as a potential starter last year in fall camp. This is it's it's crazy how it's changed. Now, all this to say a guy like Trey Moore, you can move him around to play more of that Sam linebacker position, um, you know, kind of a hybrid edge rusher. I, Colin Simmons is probably going to work his way into the conversation getting reps this year. He, he's just too good to not get reps this year. Um, I don't I think it's unrealistic to expect Colin Simmons to be a guy that's getting north of like six sacks. Even, you know, Ant Hill last year had five sacks. I don't think people understand how truly remarkable that is for a true freshman linebacker. It, he was awesome. And he's still going to get some sacks this year. He's he's in that middle linebacker role. But I'm fooling myself if I'm saying that you got Anthony Hill lining up to Trey next to Trey Moore. And they're not going to be sent in various ways to get after opposing quarterbacks and just wreak havoc. They're going to be awesome to watch this year. Just, I, I think that the edge spot, you because you, you got Baron Sorrell, member of the Freaks list. I did a piece on this earlier today. Um, the, I, a guy that's working himself into the, I think, kind of that middle round NFL draft conversation. Um, you know, multi-year starter. Um, his production has been really impressive for the last few years at Texas. And then Ethan Burke. I mean, Ethan Burke. I think people don't give Ethan Burke enough credit for his ability to set the edge and run defense. His length is a problem, and he's only going to get better as a pass rusher this year. I think you're looking at Ethan Burke as a type of guy that can be in that, what, eight-sack ballpark, you know, 10 to 15 TFLs. You're including run stops in that. That's He's going to be really good. So I think edge is the, is the obvious one for me. I would say that's probably the strongest position group for me at the moment. Um, behind, that's probably the star position. Um, I think I don't know how you couldn't be confident in what you have at the star position right now because you've got two guys that I you, I just don't know how you're going to keep them off the field this year with Jalen Gilbo, who's now getting the first team reps at nickel and then J or J Jotty Barron, who I keep saying I'm I'm a big Jotty Barron stan, um, I, it, you know. For any stat nerds out there, I throw a ton of stats out there about Jade, but I mean, his ability to understand defenses, to you know, really be like a, a defensive coordinator of the secondary, just in the way that he sees the field and can make plays out in space and contest space. I think he's tremendous. Um, he's probably going to get some time at corner and safety this year, just given his cross training and you know where they're trying him out at different spots in the secondary and team drills. Um, I, Malik Muhammad, I think. I think that combination of Malik Muhammad to me and potentially Jade Barron gives me some confidence at corner if that's what they end up rolling with this fall, but we'll see there. Um, and then I think the third one for me at this point is probably, you know, I want to say safety just because I think that, that will be much improved, but I don't think that'll be the case. I, I'll go with, I, I'll just go with linebacker broadly because I wanted to speak to the depth here. I think that. 
linebacker is going to be really good this year because I think not only do you have guys with a little bit more experience, now obviously David Benda is, you know, your sixth year senior that really has come into his own and been, I think, better than a it, I mean, Shane can talk about this. We've talked about David Benda more on this show than you would ever think that any show would. Um, well, about, uh, speaking of the, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, call back to our earlier conversation about potentially moving uh, different positions to running back. David Benda, what was that, 2019? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Wait, Jordan Whittington. Yeah. <laughs> That's Holy crap. I forgot around. about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was a wild year. Uh, yeah. No, David Benda, um, guy with all sorts of versatility, speaking of getting hats to the football. Yeah. Both sides of the ball there. Um, and then Anthony Hill. I mean, the guy's going to be. I think an all SEC linebacker this year. Um, definitely one of the best players on this defensive side of the ball for the Longhorns. I and beyond that, I mean, you got guys like Trey Moore, like I think Darian Glett, Leon Galafau. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Mo Blackwell. Um, hell, even Ty Anthony Smith, who I think is showing that he can contribute early in his first year or two on campus, that he's really ready to do that. I, there's just so many guys in this linebacker room that I think are ready to show what they can do, even beyond, you know, your David Bendas, your Anthony Hills, Mo Blackwells that have started before and, you know, were a really important piece of the defense last year. You know, the loss of Jalen Ford is a huge thing, but it goes to show how deep this linebacker room is. We're not really talking about the loss of Jalen Ford a ton. As good as he was, you know, second – Third team All American 2022, same thing last year. I mean, this guy was awesome and does did everything. And I think that you got Anthony Hill, David Benda, Mo Blackwell back there, and I don't think there's a concern that these guys are going to skip a beat this fall. So I'll pass it over to y'all. Whatever you think the three best position groups are on the defensive side of the ball. Well, I, I totally agree with the edge, uh, Andrew. Uh, I, I think that's probably one of the deepest positions that they have, and the versatility. Just think, uh, you know, if they come with a kind of that amoeba type pass rush, how many guys they can line up coming at you six or seven deep and still be able to cover on the back end? Uh, Jade Barron uh, at the star position and Gilball have been having great camps. Uh, I had a chance to uh, listen to uh, and, and speak with Jade Barron uh, at the SEC media days. And he was just confident, oozing confidence, you know, from where he was, you know, the swag head to toe, just his maturity. And I think that's the reason he came back for his senior season is he understands what the purpose is and what his, uh, you know, what his role will be. Because he was a guy that could have gone on to the NFL, but he decided to come back. And you mentioned Anthony Hill Jr. He's going to develop into a first round pick, freshman All-American. You're not just a guy that you're going to be able to sit uh, in the middle, and uh, you're going to have to locate this guy. It's going to be kind of like a Michael Parsons thing for the Dallas Cowboys. He's that type of athletic specimen when it comes to defensive football. And I think uh, on the back end at the cornerback position, you're going to see Malik Muhammad develop into that all-American type corner. He has the length, he has the skill set, the feet, uh, and he, you know, he's done it for a long time. Last year, you saw glimpses when he got into the game and the play ma- playmaking ability that he has. You remember in the OU game, he had a block punt for a score. You know, that's another special teams play a lot by some of your best players when it comes to depth on the Texas uh, defense. And I think that these guys are taking the next step. I think uh, that Baron Sorrell has really stepped up and really taken a leadership role, and he's leading by example. And you mentioned uh, – David Bender, you know, is a guy that's been there and done that. He's going to be that guy. That, he's the, he's that glue guy in that linebacker room to kind of lead those guys. Whereas Anthony Hill, you know, he's that 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 uh, that superstar type of linebacker that you have that you see that that that'll have the chance to play on Sundays. I think he's definitely a guy that's going to be key into what Texas does defensively. And then you mentioned the freshman Colin Simmons. Sooner or later, he's going to break into that. Uh, into that uh, lineup where he's going to have a chance to be an impact player. Uh, you're not going to keep Colin Simmons off of the field. Now, I had a chance to see Colin uh, since I met him when he was a sophomore at Duncanville, and he's going to be that guy down the line that's going to make plays for uh, in, in the SEC for Texas. I think, you know, when you get into game six or game seven and they really start to flex their muscles, he's going to be that guy that you're going to see come up with that third down sack out of the blue that you just didn't expect to see. So uh, I think the depth here that you mentioned, you got Trey Moore. Ethan Burke is going to be a guy that's going to sneak up and possibly honorable mention all the SEC. You mentioned him getting eight sacks and his length is setting the edge on the defensive side of the ball. 
He's a guy that a lot of people are not talking about as well as a guy that can come in and be impactful. Uh, you know, Justice Finkley's had a great camp as well. Uh, and don't forget about Michael Taffy. Uh, he's a guy that came and played well last year. And, uh, you know, he's been he's been cracking some heads and I look to him to have a great scrimmage tomorrow. He's a guy that can play down in the nickel. And then his ability to tackle well in space is what I think make, uh, makes him uh, one of the better players on the defensive side for the Longhorns. Yeah, I'll, I'll be brief here uh, because y'all did a good job touching on it all. But um, my two points, I think, um, and this shows you how high I am on him, I think there's a decent chance we could uh, see Ethan Burke's name called in day one of the NFL draft in 2025. I think his length, um, his versatility, he's elite at rushing the passer. He's growing in confidence. Uh, with his play recognition in regard to stopping the run. You y'all mentioned it. There, there's a lot of bodies at, at edge, which is something that we can't uh, couldn't have said about Texas, you know, a lot in the past. But I think Burke is is gonna is gonna make his mark as the number one guy in this group, which is saying something because you know people turn to Baron Sorrell and obviously you know Trey Moore coming in the portal who 14 sacks, I believe, at UTSA. I think Ethan Burke is going to have a massive year and, and get to that double digit sack mark that We've been missing since Joseph Osai. The other point for me, um, and Andrew, you kind of briefly touched on this. You know, Jalen Ford, who should have won Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year in 2022, had another great season last year. Uh, and we're not really talking about his departure because of what we have at the linebacker position, specifically middle linebacker with Anthony Hill making the transition. I mean, I think there, there are going to be some hiccups early on. But between Hill and Leon Lafau, who I, one of my favorite players on the team, uh, between those two guys, I have the utmost confidence in middle linebacker. And when Hill does kind of transition into that um, Sam role on certain down and distances, if Lafau's on the field, um, supreme confidence in him. So I think middle linebacker um, as a whole is a position that, you know, over the next two, three, four years, uh, I'm very confident. Uh, on, on what Texas has there. Um, but yeah, just as the defense as a whole is, is exciting. You just want to sure up the back end and uh, there's a lot of talent back there and practicing against those wide receivers is certainly going to help you because you're not going to, these defensive backs aren't going to face many receivers in the regular season uh, that are much better than what Texas is trotting out every practice. I got a quick quiz question for y'all again, before I get into the position groups I'm least confident in. Um, you know, Shane, you mentioned in here that, you know, it's been a while since we kind of had that big double digit sack guy that can really make an impact collapse in the uh, collapse in the pocket and really get into opposing quarterbacks. Do you all know the last player that had over 10 sacks in a season in Texas? Was it not Osai? Uh, mm-mm. Osai had double digit uh, TFLs, but no. Oh Sergio Kindle? Uh, maybe? That'd no, it was guess. more recent than Sergio Kendall. Okay. Uh, gosh, he wore number 98. He was a, a, a pass rusher, number 98. What was his name? He went to the league. Oh, I can't think of his name. Malcolm right Brown now. didn't get it out of the D-tackle position, did he? No, I don't think so, no. He, he played for the Tennessee Titans. Uh, gosh. Arakpo? Are you thinking Arakpo? Arakpo, yes, Arakpo. Arak he... He had a lot of sacks. It's more recent than Arakpo, too. It, it's from the 2013 season. Oh, that... oh, 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 man. Um, yep. Uh, Jackson Jeffcoat. Yeah, Jeffcoat. Jackson, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he was Defensive Player of the Year in the Big 12 that year. Uh, right. 20 TFLs, yeah. 13 sacks, yeah. Wow, um, 13. Okay. During yeah, that. Yeah, Brian Arakpo is who I was thinking of. I couldn't spit it. I could see his face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Jeff Coat, I don't, I remember this because this was my uh, mark. It, I, this is, we talk about this all the time because of the old Big 12 thing, but uh, I did my undergrad at Oklahoma State. So my freshman year at Oklahoma State was, I, uh, I think Jack, yeah, Jackson Jeff Coat's last year at Texas. But I remember watching him that year because all of his sacks, I remember, came in Big 12 play that mm. he just, destroyed the Big 12, except the one game that he didn't make much of an impact for me at the time, thank God, was Oklahoma State. So, but mm. he was just a monster that year. Because didn't Texas Definitely. end up winning a big a share of the Big 12 title that year? 
I think so. Yeah. If not, they were yeah. in second. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I he was yeah, he was crazy to watch. Um now, okay. We've touched on at this point basically every position group on the defensive side of the ball to various extents of you know, I, I just think that as I've said at the beginning of the video, I've really come around on this defense and I think that they will be I'd say a top half defense in terms of defense, defensive efficiency, uh, scoring defense, because I think that there's a lot of depth here. So I think they can really bow up on the tighter areas of the field when they need to really rotate guys, keep you keep them fresh and, and stay efficient. Uh, you know, the obvious one for me of where I do have concerns is still at that field corner position. I don't quite know what they're going to do yet. I do think that the depth there is pretty solid. You have a lot of options. You know, you brought in Javian Cole from San Jose State in, in the transfer portal during the spring window. You've got Gavin Holmes, who by all accounts has come, all, come along pretty strong. I think that he really started settling into more of that traditional field corner role down the stretch last season where I still think it took him a while to get used to that role of taking more of a back seat, not being, you know, the guy in certain situations where he was just a backup cornerback last year. I, that's just the way it was. And so, you know, I, I think the field corner position, whether it's, you know, Barron playing over there in certain situations, I think will happen. Or if it's Cole or Holmes, who are all going to be seeing action there, it's still got to take a little bit of time for the cohesiveness to get there for all these guys to say, okay, this is my role. Like, you know, this is what I, I am able to make an impact on for the secondary. Um, whereas boundary, you're, you're pretty much set there with Muhammad, who I think is going to be one of the best, I think, one-on-one -on -one corners that you see in the SEC this year once he really starts coming into his own, um, which he did start to do late last season. I think he's only going to get better this year. Um, the two other ones for me, nose tackle, I still think. Bill Norton, I think, is going to, you know, he's he's big, 6'6", 330, 325-ish. I mean, I think he'll be solid, but he, you know, he's probably going to give you 20, 25 snaps per game there. They're trying to rotate guys, keep them fresh. You know, Tia Savea can play nose. Um, I'd be interested to see if they do that Alfred Collins, Vernon Broughton duo with, with the top unit, what that looks like from a technique perspective, because Collins is mostly played three tech um, or more like kind of that hybrid four tech in the last few years, whereas Vernon Broughton, I don't, I still don't think he's at the point where he's going to be able to anchor. I think he's a good pass rusher. I think he's really, really good at being able to work through one-on-one -on -one or even, you know, some of, I think some of his, I think some of his like hand usage, some of his swim moves are the best that you see of any Texas defensive lineman in the pass rush, but run defense is still a work in progress for him as we've seen the last few years. Sadir Mitchell isn't where you would hope he would have been at this point. He was supposed to be that next nose tackle up after, you know, Sweat and Murphy. And so mainly Murphy playing at the true nose spot. I, I don't know what the answer is beyond Bill Norton at this point. I think you, you find a, a different juncture of guys that can kind of combine to be effective, experienced defensive tackles. You're still looking for the answer in the rotation, though, at that one specific spot. Lastly, I'm going to say the safety rotation. I'm still not sure what they're doing there yet. Um, I think that I do think the safety rotation will be much better. You got, you know, you got guys this year like Derek Williams and Andrew McCuba that are, are just going to be really solid starting safeties in the SEC. And then, you know, Mark, you had mentioned Michael Taff. You got um, Jelani McDonald, who I think will play a role here. He's been getting the first team reps. But I think the fact that you still got a lot of movement with the first and the second team safeties, I don't think Blake Gideon and Pete Kwiatkowski know what they're doing there yet. I, I don't I, I don't think they fully have the rotation figured out. And I think when you're playing teams and you look at, well, yeah, week four, you got guys that have played this defense before. That Blake Shapin, you got Jeff Levy. I don't think that Texas is going to lose to Mississippi State by any means. But I think it's a little concerning that you're still trying to figure out the safety rotation before you got OU in, what, game six? And then you got Mississippi State in game four that's coming from an OU offensive coordinator. Potentially, they can find some weak spots in that safety rotation and can cause some more questions to be asked. I think that that I, I hope to see some progress out of that during the scrimmage tomorrow, some cohesiveness there. Again, I mentioned earlier where you, you see a lot of competitiveness out of the safeties. So those would be my three.
Well, I, I'll, I'll back door you and, and start with the defensive uh, nose tackles, the three techniques, the inside guys. You just got to get more productions uh, out of those guys because of what Sweat and Murphy left voided there. Uh, that's a big; those are big holes to fill. I, I think that you you know you mentioned Bill Norton, but that's more of a, a space eater type of guy. You know what I mean? That, that kind of fits more of your traditional nose guard or nose tackle. That guy that really is a space eater and can kind of control those that guard center tackle area and be a force within there. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, the cornerback position. That's that's possibly a position that's definitely going to need playmakers at it. You know, definitely have all the uh, confidence in Malik Muhammad to do what he's supposed to do over there. But you may see Jade Barron uh, play some corner over there as well. Um, I think that. Uh, Gavin Holmes is a guy that's going to have to prove himself as well uh, with Cole coming in from San Jose State. He's got the experience as far as playing collegiate uh, football and being a guy that's, uh, you know, been very feisty, very feisty in uh, in one-on-one coverage and in man coverage. But can he handle these SEC type of receivers and SEC type of, uh, you know, you have to play run defense on the cornerback position as well. Can he tackle and hold up body-wise? week to week. Those are some of the things that you have to see with those guys. And then, you know, you mentioned some of these guys that that haven't played a lot. They're going to have to be counted on. And I think that's where you, in those first few games, the Colorado States, the UTSAs, that's where you're going to see some of these second and third team guys get a lot of reps because they're going to have to be ready to come in to play the Mississippi States, the Floridas and things like that. You have to get that depth and you have to get them tested early. And I think that's what that's, uh, you know, the, what they're going to be looking for coming out of the gate. Uh, I think that this is the year that Texas gets these guys the playing time. So when you look at going into 2025, you got these guys, you know, the Jordan Rubel Johnsons, the uh, Xavier Phil Sami, those guys, Kobe Blacks. They're playing backup roles now, but eventually you're recruiting these guys to come and be starters down the line as they get two and three years deep into SEC play. So the biggest thing, you know, it may not be a confidence thing. It's just an experience thing and how they hold up into some of these uh, SEC type of games when it comes to September or October. Yeah, just to kind of piggyback off the safety conversation, uh, Andrew, I think it's a it's an interesting point that you make about the rotation in the reps that we've seen, you know, through the first week of fall camp. Because on the surface, you look, and you say, wow, like the safety position is very talented. You bring in a guy like Makuba um, who, who can, you know, mesh well with Michael Taft and, and Derek Williams uh, in a nice rotation. But the fact that, you know, these guys haven't solidified anything it is a, you know, bit of a cause for concern. Um, Jelani McDonald, who uh, um, we've been really high on since, you know, Sark was able to pull him in at the end of uh, the 23 class. For him to push and and get first team reps at safety this fall is honestly like a it's not head scratching because you know we've been pretty high on, on McDonald but when you have guys like Makuba, Derek Williams, Michael Taft, for McDonald to get in the in the first team rotation, you know, I don't know if that's the best sign ever. You know, um, over to Mark's point though about the depth, I think it's big too. Just kind of an o- overarching point about it. You know, Texas, there's a chance they could play 17 games this fall. So having that depth and having these guys get real experience. Um, yeah, I know you like that. <laughs> you like that, Andrew. I, I think out of, out of any team in the country, Texas might have the best <laughs> chance to play 17 games because in order to play 17 games, you have to make your conference championship and you have to lose that. Yeah. Game, and then you have to run it to the college football playoff final. And teams like, you know, Texas, Georgia, Ohio State, Oregon, like what, those teams are, are the ones that can – you know, lose a conference title and also end up making the national title. So it's a very real possibility. And so I think, Mark, your point about, you know, rotating these different guys in and preparing them um, um, not only for the future, but preparing them for later in the season when you play teams, you know, like Florida, they they may be needed not only out of injury necessity, but even just to keep guys fresh. Um, And, you know, if you're going into a Florida game, at nine and zero or, or nine and one, I think it's week ten. Uh, does the rotation change a little bit if you know you have a a, a college football playoff spot kind of locked up? Those those are conversations we'll have throughout the season. But I think it just speaks to why depth is so important. Um, uh, yeah, that's kind of all I have. I mean, you know, nose tackle uh, and interior defensive 
defensive line has been an issue all off season. Uh, I'll go back to it. I'll say it again. Um, good on Sark and the staff for not conforming to Dominic Williams and paying that amount of money. Um, and I like, I like that they're kind of, you know, using their money wisely, but at, at this point in time, it does hurt us a little bit when we're asking questions about the position. Speaking of staying healthy. Yeah. We need Jermaine Lole to, to stay healthy at defensive tackle. But yeah, no, I mean, all, all this to say between defensive tackle and safety that, you know, that the, the Individually, when you break down, like you, you look at the individual names on the roster and kind of sh- Shane, I know you were kind of alluding to this or just saying it outright that, you know, you look, you look at the depth chart and you can kind of get excited of like, oh, you know, if, if this combination works out or, you know, if if this guy really fits this role that, you know, these position groups are going to be really, really stout on the field this fall. But, you know, I, I, I think. Defensive tackle, I think, will be fine. I think safety is still where, you know, it's always been a thing for PK, man. He's never, unless, you know, unless he was working with, like, Jimmy Lake at Washington or something like that, basically when someone else was handling, like, the this, this secondary coaching and, and coordinator spot, that PK's never really done that by himself. And I think that can kind of give you a little bit of insight here into why Jelani McDonald might be getting those first team reps at safety is, you know, PK really liked him as kind of that hybrid chess piece safety linebacker. And they've been giving him some different looks as like a box safety in camp. They did during the spring game too. PK actually has his hands on that situation. Whereas the rest of the secondary, he's kind of been more hands off. And he's just been kind of playing this situation where you cross train guys and just figure out the best. And we're just going to figure out how to get him on the field. But Jelani is the one where it's like he actually has plans for him in different ways in the box and blitzing or coming on, whatever that is. So in a way, it makes me hopeful for what we can see out of Jelani in multiple ways this fall. I think his athletic traits, his additional year of experience in the system, full ex- offseason in the system, I think he could be really good. But I think as a whole, safety might still be a point of concern this fall. Um, I think naturally, too, when you have an offense that scores that many points, the other offense is going to try to keep up. What are they going to do? Try to throw the ball downfield. You know, who are they attacking? They're attacking the middle of the field and those safeties. So. Yeah, really let's not get to, let's not get into a conversation sound like we're LSU fans. <laughs> <laughs> it's a massive X factor, especially when you think about how many leads Texas has blown. I mean, last year it was almost blow, um, but right. So it, in the past, that's where they've been leaky at is in the secondary. And you know, I hate to bring this up because I I I I just don't think that. I don't think the cohesiveness is there yet. I I don't know if Blake Gideon and Terry Joseph, when we're looking at the end of the season, we're going to say that their jobs are going to be completely safe, that they're not going to be on the hot seat. Because I look at defensive back recruiting. I look at the defensive back production the last two seasons. And I have a hard time saying that those two position groups at corner and safety are, you know, where they are going to need to be for Texas to be a solid whole defense. You know, like the, the, all three levels of the defense are, are where they need to be by the end. I don't know. I'm just rambling. So, um, do y'all have anything else you want to add on the defense before we move on and kind of get all this wrapped up? I think that's the reason this scrimmage is so important tomorrow is we got to see the secondary, uh, live up to expectations. That's why it's key. (laughs) Yeah. No, absolutely. I, I, you know, I guess there was a point at the beginning of the video why I was, you know, kind of just saying that I guess overanalyzing the secondary is that, yeah, you need to see there's a certain thing you need to see where, but like, there's also a line you don't want to cross with like Quinn Ewers, like, you know, having turnover issues or mistakes, you know, just in a scrimmage setting. So absolutely. Yeah. You, you need to see the secondary starting to starting to gel. Um, in the in the last few weeks of fall camp before, you know, some big, big games to start the season. So um, last but not least here, um, I, you know, 
one of the things that I like to do before each season is kind of come up with our own way of preseason content. You know, Shane, last year we did a bunch of collab videos with other you know, people in the Texas YouTube community and, you know, outside of that even, you know, talked with an LSU person once, USC, Oklahoma State. So, um, you know, might still try to get some of that done this year. But the thing that I, I put a poll up on Facebook and Twitter and and what y'all I'm saying y'all as people who follow engage with the site said you wanted to see was an EA college football 25 dynasty sim um we just got uh, a big update to the game where I uh, like the dynasty rankings and everything kind of got fixed so you know just from a sim mode you can kind of you know see what different games might look like and things like that um you know Shane you said just it kind of hits you this year with the expanded 12 team playoff, how long the season is going to be comparatively, you know, young college football fans have at least been used to the playoff era. And, you know, I, it gives you one at what it gives you three games instead of one, but you know, it still, it gives you that extra week of college football to look forward to. So, but as someone that, you know, I came up watching college football during the BCS era I, I'm I'm used to college football basically being over by the second week of January. Now we're talking third week. It's yeah, and we'll see where it goes from here because who knows if it'll expand again. But where do y'all? Because I think it's hard to say that you know in most dynasty. I might be completely wrong on this. I don't know. I have not done a full dynasty mode on EA College Football 25 yet. I've been mostly sticking to Road to Glory. Um, but <laughs> I it, it's I. You know, I think if you look at it in most Sims, you're probably seeing Texas in the playoff or at least in that conversation. So how many wins do you all think we come out of this dynasty Sim with? The plan is for me to have all this wrapped up content wise by the start of the regular season. So kind of going through games in the next few weeks here, posting content on social media and on the site. So how many wins do you all think Texas comes away with for, you know, kind of one season Sim? Uh, they're, they're good for at least 11. I think they're a level okay. win team. Um, you know, they're they're uh, you know, looking in the SEC, they're definitely in the top two, three. Uh, I won't say that they're gonna win it because you still have to go through Georgia, still have to go through Bama. Uh, you know, I, I think I think Texas has a chance to go unblemished into the Texas A and M game. And I think with that rivalry coming back and the emotions that are gonna be tied to that game. That's probably going to be even more trickier than the uh, than the Red River Classic. I think that the A and M game is going to be a game that Texas comes down to, and it could be a deciding factor. They have a chance to really roll into this. Uh, you know, depending how everything goes and how everything shakes out, they do have some big games. Uh, you know, they got the Michigan game. If they get past Michigan, that'll really pre- pre- uh, you know put them into that top one or two. Uh, in the rankings because, you know, strength of schedule and going on the road. So that's, that's, that's big. Yeah. yeah for me, I mean, in, in the dynasty and in the, in the, the real season, I'm always a little apprehensive. Um, I'm 20, I'm 25. So I missed the Vince young years uh, and really started locking in on Texas in the Colt McCoy years. But, you know, for a lot of my life, it was let down. So even with the team ranked in preseason inside the top five, Still a little apprehensive, but to me, the season is really four games. It's it's at Michigan, it's the Red River against Oklahoma, it's Georgia the next week, and it's at A and M. And so I think yeah, at least want to split those two, which would put you at ten and two. I'm I'm with Mark. I, I think you know the mark is probably eleven and one. Um, Texas will be favored in every game, but the one against Georgia, they're they're also higher rated in the video game against uh, all, all teams besides Georgia. Um, so I think an eleven and one finish would would make a lot of sense yeah you know i'm i'm looking at it here and mark you mentioned it, it, it you kind of hit the nail exactly on the head there with texas a&m and ou they're two of the highest two of the 15 highest rated teams in the game but i think ou where were they in the coaches poll was it like 15 or yeah. 18 or something like that so and and A&M is much more highly rated in the game than they are in the preseason coaches poll. And so, um, you know, I yeah, the schedule is tougher than I think rankings might otherwise indicate. So because I do think they make it to the playoff. But like, 
you always get some weird team in in the Sims that I have seen, like an NC State or a Boston College that somehow makes it all the way to the national championship game just because the ACC is just so just kind of weak this year. Mm. I'll so go. I, I will say. Um, Sorry, Shane, what was your number? I, I was at 11 regular season wins. Oh, oh regular season. Dang. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mark, was, say, was your 11, was that was that total or was that just regular season? Uh, 11, a regular season. A regular season. I mean, yeah, I, I, I kind of I, I take it as te- Texas is, is higher rated than every team but one. So they should win 11 Texas, or 12. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, but on their schedule, on their schedule. On the schedule. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking even if they make it to the SEC championship game, then you still probably got to go through Alabama, who's more highly rated, or Georgia again. Maybe even like an LSU or an Ole Miss that are both kind of within one or two overall points of Texas. Um, I'll go because I'm always the more conservative when it comes to these win total predictions. I'll go 10 regular season wins and then I'll say 11 total. Um. I say that they, I don't know, I feel like whenever Texas makes it to the postseason, these sort of games, that they're always bounced early for some odd reason. And so uh, they also don't have all the Texas players in the game yet that have opted in late. So you're still getting more players added. I don't know how that's impacted things, but that's a separate conversation. Okay, I then I will we'll wrap it up with this. Mark, Shane, how far do you think Texas, I'm assuming you got 11 wins. That means that they're probably in that like kind of middle tier playoff conversation. So how, how far do y'all think they make it? I, I think they get into the playoffs. It's always going to be uh, dependent on seeding and how far they get in. They make it to the SEC championship. Um, don't know if they win it. Um, you know, I, I think Alabama's a dark horse just because Jalen Milrow is going to be that X factor this year. I think, uh, you know, he, you may not feel as much pressure as, you know, with Saban looking over your back as versus Kalen DeBoer, who's more of a quarterback-friendly type of coach. Milrow's going to be that all-conference guy. I think he's going to have a big year, maybe even be up for Heisman Trophy consideration. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think that Alabama sneaks in there, uh, and it's possibly uh, Alabama-Texas uh, uh, SEC title game. Uh, I, I think that Texas definitely gets to the playoff. Now, it's just going to be – how it comes out in the seat, seatings and, you know, whether they're mm-hmm. at the bottom or the top or whether they're midway. You know, I, I think that they have the pieces to the puzzle to be elite at whatever they do, just because they have so much explosive firepower on the offensive side of the ball. Um, and, it, it, you know, everything that we've been talking about today, you know, the question mark is going to be the secondary. And can we, get, uh, you know, get a pass rush? I think Sweat and Murphy really controlled the interior who steps up and fills those roles for those two guys. Both of those guys were high draft picks. Now we have to see what's left. You know, it's the cupboard bear when it comes to getting a pass rush. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I think it lined up, you know, 11 regular season wins and you drop the SEC title game um, to probably Georgia, uh, which sets you up if you're 11 and two, probably with that five slot, which is kind of nice. Um, you'll end up playing the, the uh, group of five, likely the group of five team in the first round and then likely the winner of the big 12 in the second round. Um, and then that'll get you to the final four. Uh, for video game purposes, I think Oregon is, is tough to tough to beat with Dylan Gabriel spreading it out with those wide receivers. And, you know, funny enough, uh, Max Olson of the athletic a couple weeks ago um, ran 25 simulations of college football and, and then wrote an article about it. Texas only made the playoff in seven of the 25 simulations. Wow. Um, and okay. they only reached the final four one time. Um, okay. Which which was very low, in, in my opinion, uh, and I think all of our opinions. Oregon won the title nine of 25 times. So, wow. uh, w- w- as Andrew Jesus mentioned, the, g- the game was a little Dylan buggy. Gabriel always goes crazy on that game. Yeah, the game was a little buggy to start, so maybe now it, it'll be a little different. Uh, for what it's worth, Texas A&M made it 13 of 25 times, so I don't know how realistic really? these Sims were. Yeah. But, uh, no, it'll be fun to track. Uh, um, I mean, Texas is a fun team uh, to, to play with in, in college football, 25, and in real life they're going to be fun as well. 
Just a little interesting tidbit for y'all on the original EA College Football 25 team rate, like the overall ratings for the teams. Um, Memphis and Arkansas, both six overall points higher than Washington. Wow. So since we're talking about Kalen DeBoer and everything like that, that kind of caught my eye of like, wow, he really left some damage in his wake, leaving for that Alabama job, but also like, he has some high expectations for Memphis this year. <laughs> yeah. And he, Arkansas too. I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're that good, honestly, but separate conversations for a different day when we're more looking forward to November. Um, all right. I, I mean, we're, we've been, God, I'm excited for the season, but we've, this, this video has run pretty long. It's almost an hour 45 now. Um, anything else y'all want to wrap up with before we get out of here? All right. Well, uh, you know, I, I, I know that it's been a little inconsistent for the uploads during the off season here, specifically during the summer, but I mean, we're back in action now. Uh, stay tuned on the site for coverage. Got fall practice stuff scrimmage tomorrow. Probably this video will go up on Saturday, recording Friday. So, um, you know, you'll probably be getting this as, as scrimmage fallouts coming out in, in, in the headlines. But um, stay tuned, uh, especially here for the next few weeks um, for uh, Andrew Miller. Mark, thank you for joining us here today. And I'll look out for some of his stuff on the side as well. Shane, um, that's pretty much it. Welcome.